if you are totally new, don't worry. I'll tell you what you need to know uh, for the problems we're going to work through today. And if you uh, have some GRE experience, the first bit that we do may be a refresher, but you'll definitely get to see some new problems. Um, all the problems we're going to do today are drawn from this book. Uh, it is literally five pounds. Actually, I think it might be a little bit more, like six point something. Uh, it's an enormous book. Um, I always say if you're going to get two books, uh, one book should be the official guide to the GRE because it's made by the publishers of the test. And the second book should be this one uh, because it is an totally uh, enormous resource. You will not exhaust it. There are practice problems on every every topic you'll see on the GRE divided up by chapter according to topic. So you can say, I want to do an hour of inequalities. There's a chapter of, you know, 40 inequalities problems for you to do. Uh, and we are going to see some of those inequalities problems today. Uh, we're going to start just by looking at a format of one question type, quantitative comparison, because we're going to see a bunch of those quantitative comparison problems today. Um, but our big theme today is going to be dealing with inequalities, because inequalities, I found, are one of the algebra topics that are most troublesome for people. So we're going to look a little bit at how to deal with these, a few different ways they show up on the test, um, and we're going to solve a bunch of problems using inequalities and absolute value, which is also a topic I know many people do not love. So quant-themed session today, we're going to solve a bunch of problems, uh, hopefully learn a cool thing or two along the way. All right. Um, there is a, a Q&A function that you'll see, but you're welcome to just throw questions into the chat if you have them as we go along as well. So this is what a QC question looks like. You'll get a quantity A. Uh, QC, by the way, stands for quantitative comparison, uh, which is a hint about what we're going to be doing here. We always get a quantity A and a quantity B, and sometimes we get some other information up top. Um, for those of you with GRE experience, what is our task here when we see a question that looks like this? What is this question asking us to do? Yeah, nice, Chrissy. Find the relationship between A and B. We want to make a comparison. Um, and we'll choose from one of four answers, A, B, C, or D. Uh, so we want to say, is one definitely greater? Or are they equal? Or maybe we can't tell. Now, if we choose A, B, or C, we want to be certain that that's always the case in every single every single option that we might test out. We're always going to get A is greater. We're always going to get B is greater. We're always going to get that they're equal. So A, B, and C are answers where we are 100% certain. If I choose D, though, I'm saying not just I don't know, but there might be two different options. Like sometimes I try it and I get this one's bigger. I try a different number and I get the other one's bigger. So D is our sometimes one way, sometimes another way where we're looking at two different cases. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to see a bunch of these QC problems today, um, and we're specifically going to look at ones that have stuff to do with inequalities and absolute value. So to start, if I see things being compared to zero, uh, like if I see something like x is greater than zero, what is the GRE telling me? What, are they, what kind of number is x? Yeah, x is positive. And if I conversely say something like y is less than zero, uh, someone other than Chrissy, because I know Chrissy's got it, uh, what are they telling me about y? Yeah, nice. Ah, so many people. Cool. Uh, y is negative. Awesome. So when I see comparisons to zero in a GRE problem, I immediately know I'm in the world of positives and negatives, and that's what I want to consider. One thing that helps a lot with these quantitative comparison problems is noticing the right stuff. Because if you notice the right clues in the QC problem, you're, all, you're well into solving it. Every problem has clues in it that tell you something about how to solve that problem. So I just want to look at a couple, a couple little snippets, uh, not whole problems, and think about what we notice. So let's say I saw something like this. X squared times Y is greater than zero. What, what would you notice here? What would you know about uh, these different elements in this expression? Ooh, we got y is, yeah. Why, why does y have to be positive? I agree. I'm on board. 
And I see that this whole thing, X squared times Y, is definitely positive. What do I know about X squared? Yeah, so it's not that X itself is necessarily positive, Amy. I don't really know what X is, but I do know that anything squared is always going to be positive, right? Because if X is negative, I'm going to have a negative times a negative that gives me a positive. And if X is positive, then I'll still have a positive. So anything squared, always positive. So that's positive. And then the whole thing has to be positive. I know Y is positive too. So as soon as I saw this in a QC problem, I know like, oh, great. I know the sign of X. Um, and given that this is the information the test is giving me, knowing the sign of X is probably going to help me. Now, this is a skill you can train. So if you looked at this and you didn't immediately notice, oh, yeah, Y is positive, no worries. You can practice this. You can put little prompts like this on flashcards, put the prompt on the front, and then put what you want to notice on the back. And you can flip through those just like you'd flip through vocabulary flashcards, and you'll be amazed how much faster you get at spotting these types of patterns with just a little bit of practice like that. Let's try, let's try another couple. Get a little more complicated. So what about this one on the left here? Let's start with this one, A, B, and C. What do we know about A, B, and C? Amy, why does A have to be negative? Nice, yeah, something squared is positive. Something to the fourth, another even exponent, also positive. But I know that it equals a negative, so I have to get a negative in there somewhere, and it has to come from A. A is negative. Can I say anything for sure about the signs of B and C? Do I know if B and C are positive or negative? No, B and C still indeterminate. So I, when I see an even exponent, I always want to think, okay, has to be positive as a whole, don't know about underlying variable. All right, now let's try the one on the right. What do I know about P, Q, and R? Yeah, I know the whole thing has to be positive. The whole thing is positive. And yeah, I know that Q to the fourth is also positive. So what does that mean for P and R? If I need to get a positive result, and I know Q is positive. Ah, nice, Liza. Yeah, so I saw some people saying, oh, P and R are positive. Definitely true. Could all be positive. Yep. But they could also both be negative. Don't forget that that two negatives would also make a positive. So here I have two different options for P and R. And that's a good thing to keep in mind too. If you have three things multiplied to make a positive, there could be two positives, or they could be all positive, sorry. Or they could have two negatives and the one positive. And the GRE really likes this trick because a lot of people forget this option. So right away, just by seeing that there's that second option, you're already one step ahead of the test. So now let's see how this, how this stuff shows up in some actual problems. Let's take a look at a QC problem. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a QC problem. I'm going to give you some time to solve it. Does anyone know what the average, the average length of time we want to spend on one of these QC problems is? Cool. This is going to be useful. Uh, it's one minute and 15 seconds. Yeah, Danielle, you're close. Uh, so on average in a quant problem, um, most quant problems, I want to spend about two minutes on. QC, I can do a little faster, one minute, 15 seconds. So overall, the average for a quant question does work out to a minute 45, Danielle, but we kind of, we save a little more time for the non-QC questions because we can do QC a little faster. I know a bunch of you guys are new, though, so I'm not going to make you do this next problem in a minute and 15 seconds. I'm going to give you actually a minute and 45 for this one because it's the first 
probably one of the first QC some of you guys have done. Um, if you get an answer, don't chat it in yet. Just keep it to yourself. Uh, and then I'll have you guys all chat in at the end of that minute and 45 seconds. All right. Here you go. Try it out. All right, that is a minute and 45 seconds. So everyone go ahead and chat in an answer. Even if you have to guess, um, being ready to sort of give up guess and move on is an important GRE school. So everyone chat in. If you had to answer this question right now, which answer would you pick? Uh, remembering A means A is always greater, B means B is always greater, C means they're equal, D means they can't. we can't tell. Cool. All right, I threw you guys off the deep end a little bit here. Uh, this one, I actually meant to give you a slightly easier one first, but I uh, accidentally jumped to the harder one. So if this felt like, oh, you got it, that's awesome. This is a tricky problem. Um, how did that timing feel? Like too much time, too little, about right? <laughs> cool, that's good. All right, nice. Uh, so sometimes for these these positives and negatives problems, I like to make a chart. Uh, charts are really great. The more you keep your work organized, uh, the happier you will be. Um, so let's see, A, B, C, and I also have to deal with A, B. So let's think, we see here we have our greater than zero, less than zero, so we know we're in the land of positives, negatives. Now when I see A, B, C, all three of those, what do I know about the signs of A, B, and C if they're gonna be less than zero? Just looking at this A, B, C up top. Yeah, I could have one is negative for sure. Like I could have negative, positive, positive, or B could be negative. One of the three could be negative. Um, there's another option too. What's my other option for A, B, and C? If I'm gonna get a negative result. Yeah, I could have all three negative. So I know I either have this where one is negative or I have this where all three are negative. And I'm not yet sure which one of these three is negative. I'm stuck in an A, could be different. Second piece of info, B squared times C uh, is greater than zero. What do I know here about B and C? Yeah, nice, because B squared is positive, so that means C also has to be positive. So if I'm thinking about which of these cases I can use, can't use the second case, I have to use this one. Nice. So what do I now know about A times B? If C is positive, what does that mean A times B has to be? 
Yeah, nice. A times B has to be negative. Awesome. Because I don't necessarily know, maybe A is negative and B is positive, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe A is positive and B is negative. Doesn't matter. They're always going to have opposite signs. So AB has to be negative. And the many of you who chose answer choice B were correct. I saw a bunch of people choosing D, and I'm curious, what, what tripped you up here? Is it running out of time? Did you miss something in the clues? Did it just feel like too much organization, too much info to organize? Uh, where where did people run into trouble with this? Don't be shy because mistakes are where we learn cool stuff. Uh, there's nothing more disappointing to me as a teacher than teaching a problem and having everybody get it right because it means <laughs> maybe we're not going to learn as much interesting as when people get it wrong. Where were the sticky points in this problem? Yeah, the organization, for sure. Um, trying to keep all this stuff in your head can really trip you up. Uh, that's one reason I like a chart. There's other ways to organize too, but having a system for organizing your work on paper and not in your head will save you so much time, so much energy and quant, I promise. The more you write down, ultimately the more efficient you will be. Oh, Alicia, that's a great point too. So looking at them individually, but then remembering, okay, I have to combine. Um, that's another thing to note. It sometimes comes up. If you see uh, variable B in one inequality, it's going to be the same variable B in the other inequality. They're not going to sort of switch switch games on you in between. All right, let's try let's try another one like this, uh, and then we'll look at something a little different. Okay. Uh, here you go. Try this one. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a minute and a half for this one. I'm going to cut down our time a little bit. Uh, like before, don't chat in until I tell you. All right, that is a minute and a half. So everyone go ahead. If you had to answer right now, what answer would you pick? Cool. We are again strong leaning toward B, a couple, a couple people pointing toward D as well. All right. Let's uh let's make a chart. Really into charts. Should have four columns in my chart. All right. Uh, don't have to draw well to do well in the GRE, but you do have to draw something. Keep organized. Okay, so I have A, B, and C, and I'm looking for A times C. A, B greater than zero. What do I know about A and B? Nice. Both positive or both negative. So I have two options. And B, C less than zero. What do I know about B and C? Yeah, one has to be positive, one has to be negative. I have to have a mix. And I don't know which is which. So I could have B is positive, C is negative, or I could have B is negative, C is positive. 
So what does this tell me about AC? What is the, the product of A and C going to be in both of my cases here? Yeah, it's always going to be negative. So an interesting thing about this problem is I'm not that certain. I don't know like if A is definitely positive or definitely negative. Same with C. There's still some uncertainty here. I don't actually know what the values of A and C are. Super uncertain about that. But I know enough to make the comparison and say, okay, definitely AC is negative. It's always going to be less than zero. Quantity B is greater. It's an important thing to keep in mind with these QC questions. Um, you don't have to solve them to like a total certainty the way you sort of solve a traditional math problem. You just have to do enough work to make the comparison. That's why we can often do these faster than regular math problems because we don't necessarily have to do as much work if we notice the right things, if we're smart about it. So here we notice, okay, comparisons to positives and negatives. Let's think about it that way. We organize our work and it can be a pretty quick problem. I gave you guys a minute and a half and I got lots and lots of correct answers from many of you. So going super well. What would happen, did anyone try and pick numbers for A, B, and C here? Did anyone try to do this by testing numbers? How did it go, Brittany? Cool. Yeah, it works. Um, that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, testing numbers is always uh, uh, something we can resort to in problems. Yeah. And that's, Brittany, that's awesome. Like using numbers to sort of figure out what the trend is works really, really well. Also a good approach. And we'll probably see some problems today where that's going to serve you really well as they get more and more complicated. So totally fine if that's where you're comfortable with, if that's the first strategy that pops to mind, using numbers to try and pick up that trend. Awesome. All right. Let's, let's look at something a little different for a moment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about combining inequalities. Inequalities are really just equations, um, or they can be manipulated just like equations. Uh, one way to think about it is that both describe relationships. So equations describe a balance. This is a scale. My drawing is terrible. An equation you can think of as describing a balanced relationship. So if you do the same thing to both sides, you keep that relationship the same. Inequalities also describe a fixed relationship. It's just an unequal one. So if you do the same thing to both sides, you keep that unequal relationship the same, and that's what matters. So I can simplify an inequality. Like if I want to know something about x on its own, I can add 3 to both sides here, and I get x is greater than 4. The big difference between an inequality and equation, obviously, is an inequality gives you a range of answers, an equation gives you a single answer. Well, if I, I'm not I totally sure I understand your question. Are you referring back to the previous problem? and picking numbers. If you get a chance to chat in, I will answer your question. Just tell me a little bit more about what you're asking so I can make sure I'm answering the right question. Um, another cool thing about inequalities, and this is a trick a lot of people, a lot of students tend to forget, uh, so I want you to like burn this into your brain because it's going to help you. Let's say you got two inequalities at the top of a QC problem that looked something like this, like these, these two down here. And you want to, you know, learn something about X. Well, you can combine these two inequalities by stacking and adding them, just like you would stack, uh, stack uh, an equation. Ah, cool. I'll address that in a sec. Um, so as long as I line up my signs, like this, I then stack and add. So one plus three is four, greater than, uh, yes, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna fill you in in a sec. Two uh, X minus X is X, minus three plus two is minus one. Now I can add one to both sides and I get X is greater than five. So as long as I line up the signs, I can stack and add inequalities to combine them. And that can be a really nice way to simplify if I get a complex pair or trio of inequalities at the top of a problem. Yes, you did miss something. We went over the answer choices for QC questions like those we just solved, and they are A, B, C, and D. Uh, can someone remind us in the chat what do these answers stand for?
What does answer choice A mean in a QC question? Yeah, A means quantity A is greater, B means quantity B is greater, C means that the two quantities are equal, and D means you can't tell. So those are your four options to choose from. Uh, sorry if you came in a little bit late and missed those, but now, now you have them uh, for our next problem, which is going to involve some inequalities. Here you go. Uh, I'll give you guys a minute and a half to work on this one. All right, I gave you guys a little bit extra time on that one. Go ahead and chat in your answers. Sorry about that. My roommate came home. My dog got excited. Cool. D, uh, how did you guys do it? What was the first thing you did here? What's our first step? Distribute. Yeah, let's just do some algebra. Yep. We can simplify x. We can simplify y. So we get 3x minus 21 is greater than or equal to 9. So I get 3x uh, is greater than or equal to 30 and x is greater than or equal to 10. Do you guys agree? Did I do my math right? Cool, so I have, I know something about x. It's greater than or equal to 10. Awesome. Now I have 0.25y minus three is less than or equal to one. I add three to both sides, less than or equal to four, and now I can multiply both sides by four to get rid of that 0.25. So I get y is less than or equal to 16. Cool. I have two different options going on. Uh, do you guys agree? Did I do my math right on this one? Y is less than. Awesome. All right, so how do I go from here to an answer? How do I, how do I get to an answer here? Ah, yeah. 
So for example, x could be 10, and then that means that y, what could y be? What's a possible value for y? Yeah, y could also be 10. So they could both be equal. Or let's say x is 9 and y is 16. Then quantity b is greater. And I can stop there. Because they've seen, okay, there's a possible combination of x and y where they're equal. There's a possible combination where one is greater than the other. Could be a possible combination where a is greater too. But as soon as I have those sometimes one way, sometimes another way options, I want to go ahead and choose answer choice D. And that is our answer. Ooh, yeah, Lucia, I like a number line too. That, that can be a nice way to visualize inequalities as well. So I could drop my number line and I could say here is... 10, so x is going to be less than or equal to 10. All right, sorry, greater than or equal to, ooh, I messed that up, greater than or equal to 10. And y is going to be less than or equal to 16. So I see there's some overlap where they could equal each other or they could diverge. Um, sorry, this should be 11 to make this correct. I did my things opposite. So another good thing to keep in mind if you're stuck with inequalities, drawing them on a number line can help as well. All right, let's try another one. Actually, let's talk about absolute value. Speaking of number lines. So absolute value is when you get these fun, uh, fun things like this. And what it's describing is the distance from zero. So if I said, for example, the absolute value of negative, or the absolute value of x equals six, what does that tell me about what x could be? The absolute value of x equals 6. Yeah, I could get a positive 6 or I could get a negative 6 because they're both, both of these are 6 away from 0. What if I told you that the absolute value of x was greater than 1? What would that tell you about x? Yeah, again, I have two options. And this is interesting. If I want to sort of solve an absolute value and an inequality, I could say, okay, let's say x is positive. Then x is greater than 1. But let's say x is negative. Then I'd have negative x is greater than 1. I can now divide both sides by negative 1. And what do I have to do if I divide an inequality by a negative number? Yeah, I have to flip my sign. So I then get x is less than negative 1. Nice. So I could draw it. Here's negative 1. x could be here. Or here's 1. x could be here. Yeah. And John, I like how you put it. x is not in the negative 1 to 1 range. But it's anything outside that uh, gives me x. So we see often when we have an absolute value, we get two different solutions. We get two different options. What if I had something like this? The absolute value of x minus 3 equals, let's say, 4. How do I solve this? I have a positive option, yeah, which is x minus 3 equals 4, and then I get x equals 7. What does my negative option look like? Yeah, I want to, one thing to keep in mind here, I want to do a negative outside the whole thing. So then I get negative x plus 3 equals 4, negative x equals 1, x equals negative 1. Yeah. So remember, if you have a big thing in the absolute value, put parentheses around that and put the x, the negative outside so you remember to distribute it throughout the whole thing. Okay. Let's try a couple absolute value problems. Here you go. Try this one. 
give you guys a minute and a half. All right, go ahead and chat in your answer. Cool. All right. Which piece of info do you want to start with? Do you want to start with the top one or do you want to start with the bottom one? Bottom. Okay. What do we learn? I agree. I like I think that's a good one to start with. X y squared is negative, less than 0. What do I know from this information? Yeah, x must be negative. Nice. And now let's deal with our top information. The absolute value of negative x is greater than or equal to 6. What do I know if x is negative? What do I know about the value of x? So x is greater than 6, it greater than or equal to 6. Does that make sense? Ah, yeah. What, what? So I can't, this could be true if x were positive, but I know it's not. What's my other option? Yeah, x is less than or equal to negative 6. I have to go with the reverse. So x is less than or equal to negative 6. Nice. Uh, why did you guys choose d? learned something about x yeah i don't know anything about y yep could be positive or negative nice yeah chrissy uh this part is that what you mean yeah so i know that the absolute value of of negative x uh is greater than or equal to six but I know that x has to be negative, right? So for this to be true, x could be greater than or equal to 6, right? Because then if I took the absolute, you know, if I take the absolute value of negative 7, that's definitely going to be greater than or equal to 6. But I know that x has to be negative from considering the second piece of information. So if I'm thinking about my number line, so to say like, okay, I know values above 6 will work, but I have to go on the negative side because I know x is negative. Negative, so I have to go in this direction instead. Because then if I have, you know, the absolute value of negative, negative 7, that's definitely going to be greater than or equal to 6 as well. 
Does that make more sense, Chrissy? Sort of like, you know, I have those two options, then I know I have to go with the negative side. What if I changed this problem and I said y is a positive integer? What would the answer then be? Yeah, nice. Yep, then the answer would be b. But since they don't tell me anything about y, I don't know for sure. Let's try, let's try another one. All right. Let's try this one. Here you go. I'll give you a minute and a half again. All right, uh, this is a tricky one. I gave you guys a little extra time. Go ahead and chat in your negative. Uh, <laughs> chat in your uh, chat in your answer. Cool. All right. So I have negative x times the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to four. All right, ah, I think we have a representative from every, every answer choice, cool. Let's, let's start actually with a sign. Let's start with this question. Is X positive or negative? Or could it be both? What do you guys think? Why is x negative? Yeah. Why does that have to be the case? I know the result is positive, positive 4. What does the absolute value of x have to be? And I know I have a negative. Yeah, the absolute value of x always has to be positive. So if I see something like this, a negative, that negative, times, I don't know the sign of x yet, times something that's definitely positive equals a positive, I know ah, this missing blank has to be a negative. So I know that x is negative. All right, so let's think about that. I have a negative times a negative x times a negative x is greater than or equal to 4. Now I can go ahead and solve. So negative x times negative x, that just gives me x squared. So I have negative x squared greater than or equal to 4. So x squared has to be less than or equal to negative 4. Or I'm not going to write this. x x times x has to be negative 
less than or equal to negative 4, so negative 2. X has to be less than or equal to negative 2. So it's definitely going to be less than my positive 2. Sorry, that scratch work on that second one was a little messy. Uh, the answer here is, in fact, B. But questions, I feel like I, I my scratch work got a little messy at the end there. Do people follow that? Or should we walk through some of that again? Why I know X has to be less than 2. Yeah. Let's, let's do it again. Let's do a simpler way, actually. I actually don't even need all this math. <laughs> sometimes you get lucky, Danielle, and it's great when that happens. Uh, sometimes we get the right answer the wrong way, or we guess and we get the right answer. This is a good thing to keep in mind about the GRE. It doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get to the right place. So I actually, I actually can stop at this point. This is enough for me. Um, so let's think this through. I have negative x times the absolute value of x is less than or equal to, is greater than or equal to 4. Now I know, let's say, let's actually try it this way. Let's say I divide this whole thing by a negative. I get x times the absolute value of x is less than or equal to negative 4. Let's look at it this way. So I'm going to just get rid of that negative sign by dividing both sides by a negative 1. Now, I know that this part, the absolute value of x, all absolute values are positive. They're always giving me positive results. And so I know that has to be a positive. But if I want to get a negative product, I then know that x has to be a negative. And then that's going to multiply together to give me something that's also negative. And at this point, once I know x is negative, I know it definitely has to be less than 2. Yeah, that's an it's an interesting question. Um, it's why I kind of waffled when I was writing out x squared. I was like, oh, that's not the right way to write it out. I uh, I could I could put negative two in here though, and it would work. Like I could have negative times negative two times the absolute value of negative two is greater than or equal to four. It works. That way. Uh, oh, Caitlin asked me um, if we're taking the square root of negative four, doesn't that give us an imaginary number? Uh, and I said, yes, that's why I waffled when I was writing <laughs> the algebra because I was like, mm. uh, that trying to take that square root is weird. But there are still values of x that will satisfy this inequality. So it, it's not, it doesn't necessarily give us an imaginary result because of the absolute value. Yeah. Yeah, the imaginary numbers don't really show up. Um, the, the, yeah, it, it, so it also, they wouldn't give you something that, that produced D because the result was imaginary. So knowing that about the GRE also kind of eliminates that pathway. It's a good point, Daniel. Um, lots of those really tricky things, not on the GRE. It's super nice. Awesome. All right. Uh, Whitley, does that make more sense? Cool. Amy, excellent question. Uh, you do not lose points for getting questions wrong. So it is often a good idea, particularly when you see a really hard problem, to say like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this and uh, I'm going to go on for the sake of time. But you should always fill in a guess because you won't lose points for guessing and you might gain points. So yes, being ready to sort of say like, oh, I'm just going to move on from this problem quickly, get my points elsewhere is a good strategy. But do fill in a guess if you're going to skip a problem. It's a really good question, really important core strategy. Okay. Let's try, let's try a couple of kind of tricky ones. Uh, I want to do one problem that's not QC, just so we get to see kind of what that looks like. So here is our question. I'll give you guys two minutes to work on this, but I just want to point out one thing, which is this problem asks you to indicate all that are true. And I see these little square boxes next to the answers. And those square boxes are always an extra hint that I can select more than one. So one, two, or all three of these options could be true. Um, let's call them, I'm going to put letters next to them just so people are able to answer. But go ahead and start working.
All right, go ahead and chat in your answer. Which of these would you pick? Cool. Lots of combinations. So we've seen a lot of uh, multiplication with positives and negatives, so I thought it would be cool to check out some division. A, B is greater than zero. So I know that this, I'm getting a positive result. Nice. So for A divided by B to be positive, what has to be true of A and B? What do I know about the signs of A and B? If A divided by B is positive. Ah, yeah, they could be both positive, right? I could have something like six divided by three equals two, or they could both be negative. So I could have negative six divided by negative three, and that also gives me two. I have two options. So now let's go through and consider our answers. Keeping in mind this, I'm looking for these answers which must be true. That's an important word, and it means all possible options of A, A, and B. Um, it always has to be true. A is greater than B. Does this always have to be true, that A has to be larger? No, right? Because I seem like six and three works, but I could also have one divided by two, and that's greater than zero. And there A is less than, so I can cross out A. What about answer choice B? Does B always have to be greater than zero? What do you guys think? Yeah, right, because we have this option here where B is less than zero. So could be, could be greater than zero, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. What about A times B? Is that always going to be positive? Yeah, because they could have a positive times the positive. That's obviously positive. Or I could have a negative times a negative, and that's also always going to be positive. So my answer is C. Also, keeping in mind, if I've eliminated A and B, I actually just should choose C because I know one of these three has to be true. So if I get rid of both A and B, just go with C if you're confident those are wrong. But I can also prove that C has to be true here. So that is our answer. Where did this trip you up? No, it always there always has to be at least one. Yeah, it's a good question. Where did this trip people up? Yeah, that's, yeah, Amy, Chrissy, Julia, this is the really, really good point to keep in mind. Um, a lot of things on the GRE are tricky, not necessarily because they're super, super hard conceptually, though there are some problems that are like that. A lot of times the GRE is tricky because of these little details and these little tricks that the test likes to play. And being really attentive to those details and those patterns is just as important, if not more important, than knowing super hard math. Um, the amount of math tested on this test is limited. Like, it doesn't go into higher level of algebra or trig or calculus or all of those really awful things that, if you're like me, you did last years ago in high school. But it's really sneaky, and it really is testing your ability to pay attention to little details. So thinking back to where we started actually with this idea of noticing stuff. Um, doing stuff like this is really important. Uh, making, making these little flashcards um, to sort of say like, okay, if I see this, what should I notice? Or if I see things like this, what should I notice? You know, something like this. Training yourself to remember could be two negatives, could be two positives. Learning these recurring patterns of the test will serve you really well. Um, and in fact, is, is as important as sort of practicing the underlying content, learning these tricks, learning where you tend to make little errors, stuff like that. So before, before we leave today, I want to do one last thing, which is I want to uh, give you a suggestion for studying. Uh, and some of you might already do this. Let me know if you do. Does anyone here use a review log? Yeah, Chrissy. Uh, how is it helpful, Chrissy? How do you use it? 
maybe an error log. Yeah, so this is a place to track, uh, just Chrissy, think things that you get wrong to, to keep a record of problems that are giving you trouble. And you wanna have three components. You wanna have the problem, you wanna have the issue, and you wanna have the takeaway. So for that last problem uh, that we just did, let's say, okay, it was a QC problem with positives and negatives, and maybe the issue is you forgot two negatives. And so you want your then takeaway to be pay attention to hidden negatives. So you're, anytime you get a problem wrong, you are noting why you got it wrong. And then you're noting what you're going to do differently the next time, what you're going to change in your behavior. This way, it's, it's forcing you, as Chrissy says, to keep track, to go back to problems that you've missed, but you'll also start to notice patterns. And if there's one thing today, it's probably recognizing patterns is going to make you way more efficient and way more accurate on the GRE. And this is a, a really powerful tool for doing that. So if you take only one thing away from today, take this. Go out, start an error log, track the things you're getting wrong. Um, you'll probably notice you make the same types of errors repeatedly, and that's good news. It means if you correct that pattern, you'll get a whole bunch of more problems correct. All right, uh, thank you for, for being here this afternoon uh, or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, have a great Sunday night. Um, if you are at the start of your studying, uh, you can also take a free class with us, the first session of one of our courses for free. Um, you can find it on our website. It's a great way to keep getting acquainted with the test. Uh, best of luck as you study. Uh, take care.